Hello, hello, hey, sweet people. It is Foster from Inglés No Cru. Just a quick note before we get started with the show today. Today we are playing an episode of another podcast called Dog Edition. This is a podcast that was recently launched by a friend of mine, and the podcast is amazing. It's all about dogs. We talk about dogs all of the time on our show. We love dogs. So we thought it would be a really cool idea to let you hear some of these new episodes. So the show is called Dog Edition. They have crazy, engaging, funny, really, really cool stories about dogs. And they even have a cool contest right now where they're giving more than $15,000 of prize money for people that have great dog-related stories. So if you have any cool dog-related stories... You can send them their dog-related stories, and they will pay you money for that. And James specifically told me that they are looking for more international submissions. So, Brazil, that's international. Okay, so here's an episode about dogs. I hope you like it. If you like it, subscribe to the show Dog Edition, and let's get on with the show. Hello, I'm James Jacobson. And I'm Pamela Lawrence. Welcome to Dog Edition, the first show designed for you to listen to while you walk your dogs. And if you like what you hear today on your dog walk, make sure you subscribe. Just click that little button and follow Dog Edition so you never miss an episode. Today on the show, we're going to speak with Martha Teichner from CBS News. She has a new book out, and it's heartwarming and touching, and you'll love the interview. And later in the show, Dog Edition contributor Saskia Edwards brings us the story of Gobi, a scruffy, homeless little dog who earned her name after following ultramarathoner Dion Leonard on an extreme test of endurance in the Gobi Desert. So if you love dogs as much as we do, pause what you're doing, leash up your pup, and let's take a walk. We've got a lot to talk about on today's episode of Dog Edition. Hey, Pepper, want to go for a walk? Once upon a time, or more precisely, July 23rd, 2016, at about 8.30 in the morning, a chance encounter at the Union Square Farmer's Market in New York City began what can only be described as a fairy tale, but one with a complicated happily ever after. And I looked over and I saw somebody I hadn't seen in a year or two. That's Martha Teichner, longtime CBS News correspondent and award-winning journalist. She was at the farmer's market that day with her bull terrier, Minnie. They were both mourning the death of Goose, Martha's other bull terrier, and Minnie's close companion for many years. That's when she bumped into Stephen Miller Siegel. They were acquainted, as many New Yorkers are, from walking their dogs around the neighborhood. Well, there he was at the farmer's market. I hadn't seen him in a year or two. I had never seen him at the farmer's market. Uh, He came over and said, well, where's Goose? And I told him that Goose had died and that I had been searching for an older bull terrier male to um, be a companion to Minnie. Call that meeting a coincidence, or maybe fate, or the guiding hand of the universe. Call it what you like. What happened next feels like one of those only in New York experiences. And he pulled out his phone and he showed me a picture that he had taken um, when we were walking along um, the river uh, a couple of years before. And he said, remember, um, I took this picture of Minnie and Goose um, to send to my friend Carol who had a bull terrier and And I uh, said, yeah. And he said, well, um, it's my friend, Carol Fertig, and she's dying of liver cancer. And her dog, Harry, is 11 and a half and um, nobody wants him. And she's desperate to find a home for him because she's been warned that she will probably have to have him put down um, because he will be difficult to rehome. And... um, He said, would you take him? It was a deceptively simple question. Could this be the answer to Martha's wish for a companion for Minnie? I heard this 
sound bubbling up out of me saying, well, yes, if they get along. That condition, if they get along, was an out if Martha wanted to take it. But after learning a little bit about Carol Fertig... Carol was arresting and larger than life and well-read. She was smart. She was incredibly funny. She had a rapier-like sense of humor, uh, which stayed with her till the very, very, very end of her life. It seemed like a foregone conclusion. Martha would take Harry when the time came. A first date was arranged for the dogs. We sat out on the stoop for a couple of hours and um, the dogs ignored each other completely. And um, Minnie kind of flounced herself around and showed Harry her behind. And Harry completely ignored her and went digging in my pocket for treats. But the humans on that stoop had a lovely time. It was the beginning of a close and wonderful friendship. But sadly, one that would come with an ending. You know, you worry about what it's going to be like meeting and getting to know and conversing with someone who's dying. You worry that it's going to be horrible, but it wasn't. Carol's terminal liver cancer was the result of practically living next door to Ground Zero in the aftermath of 9-11. The two women had work to do. They had limited time to get Harry and Minnie to fall in love. Carol and I were like silly um, mothers matchmaking. I would say that by the third time Harry came over, it was pretty clear they would get along. They started to play with each other and roughhouse and do all the moves and Minnie diving under tables and Harry trying to go after her and, and Minnie on the couch running back and forth, teasing him while he t t tried to figure out what was going on. And, and Harry with his the bowl, uh, the metal bowl filled with tennis balls that he always carried around with him, jiggling it in his teeth and making noise with it and throwing the tennis balls and Minnie tearing after. I mean, that kind of thing made it pretty clear that they liked each other. It was puppy love after all or maybe more senior love. But Carol wasn't ready to turn Harry over to Martha just yet. I had expected her to say, okay, here's Harry, two, three meetings, but it didn't work that way at all. And it, I came to realize very quickly that Harry symbolized life as she knew it, that she had to keep him as long as possible. Because even if I said yes, um, having Harry till she couldn't take care of him anymore was how Carol clung to life. And, um, and anyway, I was fine with that because I really got to like the get-togethers. Um, they were ostensibly to socialize the dogs, but pretty soon they were gatherings of friends. This unexpected friendship could have been predestined. Fate had intervened years earlier in the 1990s. I was walking up 10th Avenue, not too far from my house, and there was an, a restaurant with outdoor tables. And there she was sitting with her first bull terrier, a white one named Violet. Martha stopped to introduce herself as a fellow dog lover of bull terriers. It was an encounter that she never forgot. There was this singular looking person with the big hat and the and big dark glasses and a dog named Violet. You don't ever forget a bull terrier named Violet. Fate stepped in once again when Carol took Harry to the vet. Martha's bull terriers happened to be there, that very same vet, at the very same time. And although Martha wasn't there with them, Carol learned who they belonged to. Martha recounts what Carol later said about that day. Ah, Martha Teichner has bull terriers, and she knew who I was because she watched Sunday morning every Sunday. She said to me, you might not believe this, but because I knew about your dogs, she said, one of the very first things I thought after I was diagnosed was, wouldn't it be great if Martha Teichner took Harry? Well, of course, she didn't even have any connection with me at that point. It wasn't until Martha bumped into Stephen that fateful morning at the farmer's market, that morning when the simple question, would you take him, was asked. 
That is when all these little coincidences began to form the connections that led to this beautiful but complicated fairy tale. I said yes, and uh, it it, um, was really, really, really profoundly meaningful to me uh, because it led me to a set of experiences that I will treasure for the rest of my life. And yes, there were sad moments and there were, you know, ultimately I knew how the story would end, both for Carol and for Harry. Uh, But on the road to that, there was just so much richness and, and so much pleasure and so much fun even. And I came away completely um, revitalized in a way because I was able to um, break out and say yes. And like all fairy tales, this one came to an end. After Carol passed away, Harry lived with Martha for 16 months before he died. Shortly thereafter, Minnie also crossed the Rainbow Bridge. With Carol's blessing, Martha wrote their story. It's called When Harry Met Minnie. The book is in stores now and also available as an audiobook, read in Martha's iconic voice. It's the legacy they all deserve and one that came from simply saying, Yes. And now, a new story has begun for Martha Teichner. She adopted Gurley recently, another bull terrier. Gurley? What? My dog wants to go out. Um, can I go let her out? Okay, I'll be right back. Gurley! We're also going to take a break. When we come back, we have another story of a chance encounter. This one was between an ultra marathoner and a scruffy little stray dog. It's a story that teaches us all a lesson in endurance. You're listening to Dog Edition. Hi, it's me again, James Jacobson, and there are three things that you should know about me. One, since 2003, I have been driven by an all-consuming mission. That mission is to help improve the quality of life for dogs and the people who love them. Two, I have founded or helped to co-found several companies that share that mission, including Dog Podcast Network. And three, every day, I give my dogs Everpup the ultimate daily dog supplement made by Functional Nutriments, which is one of those companies. What is Everpup? Everpup is an extraordinary all-in-one supplement that you sprinkle on your dog's food. It's a polyceutical, which means it contains an incredible blend of lots of different human-grade ingredients. It contains vitamins and minerals and prebiotics and probiotics and enzymes and dietary apoptogens and so much more. What you need to know is that it supports every cell and system in your dog's body. And Everpup is appropriate no matter what type of diet you feed your dog, from kibble to raw food to home-cooked. And the rich green powder is easy to add to food. Dogs love the taste. They find it delicious. And you can even try it yourself because Everpup is made with 100% human-grade ingredients. It's made here in the USA in an FDA-registered and inspected laboratory. And all the ingredients are ethically sourced and triple-checked for quality. Seeing is believing, so try Everpup for a month and see what happens with your dog. Everpup is available through select veterinarians and pet shops and Amazon, but here is the best way to try Everpup. Join the Everpup Club and get free shipping to any U.S. address. As a listener to this podcast, you can get your first shipment of Everpup for just $8, including free shipping, when you use the discount code DOGEDITION. For all the details, go to everpupclub.com and try your first full jar of Everpup for just $8. That's everpupclub.com. Welcome back to Dog Edition. Saskia Edwards submitted this next story to our 101 Dog Stories contest. She takes us on a journey to the Gobi Desert and introduces us to an ultramarathoner, a little stray dog, and an incredible test of endurance. Here's the desert dog I couldn't desert. Dion Leonard is an ultramarathon runner. Ultramarathons are not like regular marathons. For one thing, they can be a lot longer. 
and often held in extreme places and conditions. They test people psychologically, physically, and frankly, emotionally. A few years ago, Dion was about to start one of these intense races in the desert in China. The Gobi Desert in China was where this race was and one of the hottest and windiest and driest locations known to man. The race is 250 kilometre race. You know, it goes for a whole week. You have to carry all of your food and kit to survive the week as well. It was going to be rough. But what Dion didn't realise at the time was that this was to be the beginning of a much bigger test of his endurance, in a totally different way. It started with a little dog who seemed to appear out of nowhere, following and bothering Dion on day two of the race. It's about 100 runners at the race and uh, we were about to set off and run off for the day of running 25 miles, so about 42 kilometers. It was chewing on my shoes. She was chewing on specifically the gaiters that keep the sand out of your shoes. I sort of flicked her off with my foot and told her to go away. She jumped back onto my shoes and she started chewing on the sand gaiters again. Seeing this dog keeping chewing on my shoes was a little bit annoying. So <laughs> the race started and everyone's running down the trail and here I am with this damn dog on my leg and I'm trying to run down the trail and I can't get rid of it. Could you describe how she looked when you first saw her? She was in a pretty pretty bad condition. She, I mean, she was a young dog. She had really bad skin. Her hair on the back of her coat was really, really wiry. You know, you could tell she'd had a really tough life, but there was something about her. Like, she was a sweet dog. She was always very friendly with people. She trusted people. But who knows where she came from, what she was doing out there, what she was living on, what she was eating, etc. We think she's a mix between Chihuahua and Shih Tzu, which is very, very common for that part of northwest China. Very short legs, very big brown eyes, and she's got this really weird curly tail as well, and she's a really <laughs> unique looking dog. This dog didn't appear to have an owner and followed Dion all day. She actually ran the whole 25 miles that day behind me or at the time she'd run ahead of me. Yeah, for the whole day she was there, but I never spoke to her. I never gave her any of my food. I remember cr crossing the finish line that day. They were sort of clapping and cheering and playing the drums. And I thought, this is really weird. Why are they, why are they <laughs> doing that for me? And uh, it wasn't until I crossed the finish line and I looked behind me and they were still clapping and cheering and playing the drums that it was for the little dog running in behind me. <laughs> but it was at that moment because, you know, I'm such a competitive person when I go to these races. As I finished and I saw what she'd done and I just, it sort of hit me that I hadn't spoken to her, I hadn't given her any food and she collapsed in the tent next to me and I started to look after her. And Dion even gave her a name, Gobi, after the desert where she was found. She slept in Dion's tent that night. It's kind of cool, little dog had slept next to me. She smelt really bad and... Uh, I still wasn't thinking very much of it until day three. Day three was where things between Gobi and Dion changed. This leg of the race was about another 25 miles and included a river crossing with deep water and ferocious currents. They were really strong currents and it could sort of push you away, it could drag you away if you sort of weren't really strong footed. And as I was walking through the, one of the river crossings, I was getting across to about halfway when I could hear this barking and yelping and whining behind me and it sort of stopped me in my tracks. And I turned around to see this dog running up and down the river bank and she was panicking and she was worried that I'd left her there, which of course I had because I was running a race. You know, first and second mm. runners were ahead of me in the race and... Yeah, all of this commotion happened behind me and it, it, it did stop me in my tracks because I wasn't sure what was happening to the dog. And if she'd have tried crossing the water, you know, she would have been washed away. I made this split decision to go back and pick her up. And as I knelt down to pick her up, she looked at me with sort of trust and a bit of sort of love in her eyes. And I picked her up and I sort of held her a little bit away from me, just hoping she wouldn't bite me. But as I sort of held her, she sort of made her way into my sort of chest and into my arms and the next thing she's looking up at me with these big brown eyes and it was the real moment where I could see this love in her eyes and I just felt this massive connection to her and yeah, I, I can't explain what happened in that moment but that was a moment that would change both our lives forever. 
Dion jeopardised his chances of winning the race to help the dog. Gobi managed to keep running, except on days when it was too hot. Yeah, Gobi's a very fast dog. She's <laughs> capable of running much quicker than I am. And those four legs, like, they could motor through the desert. It made running the desert a lot easier for me because it put a smile on my face to see the fun she was having out there. When did you realise, OK, I, this dog has to come home with me? You know, we had so many moments out there that just made me realise that I needed to bring Gobi home and give her a better life. So I made her that promise out in the desert to, to do that. And having a very difficult, destructive, uh, depressive and abusive upbringing myself and leaving home at the age of 13, I sort of felt a little bit of myself in Gobi. So I wanted to give her a better life and be the person, I guess, that I wanted to have around me when I was younger. Dion's childhood was tough. He was homeless like Gobi too. I lived in someone's shed, I've lived under bridges, I've lived in hotels, caravans, hostels, pretty terrible conditions just to try and put myself through school and not knowing where food was going to come from one day to the next and having to go out and find a job at the age of 13. It's made me sort of a very vulnerable person growing up and something that I realised Gobi was also very vulnerable in the desert as well and that she had nothing and nobody out there to look after her. It was a simple mm -hmm. thing for me to be able to do to to sort of make the promise and then I had to sort of stick through it and make sure that uh, we got Gobi home. It was a simple promise to make, but getting Gobi home would be anything but simple. Dion had to return home to Scotland. He already had a flight booked, but Gobi couldn't come with him yet. She needed to get a bunch of vaccinations and paperwork before she could travel, but a volunteer said they'd look after her in China. She was being looked after in a city called Urumqi, a city of three million people. Dion started a crowdfunding campaign, he started getting media attention, and he actually raised all the money he needed to get Gobi to the UK. But then he got a call. And I received a phone call to say that she'd gone missing, and of course I was you know, devastated and heartbroken to hear that she'd missing in that big city of three million people as well. Gobi had run away. She'd gone missing. That was really the first sort of moment that I had to sort of test my commitment and promise to Gobi of, you know, bringing her home. Mm. So when did you decide that you'd personally go and try and find her? Well, I had to speak to my employers to say, look, uh, you remember that story <laughs> of me and the dog? And well, unfortunately, she's gone missing now. And uh, they were great. They gave me a blessing to go out there and to, to look for her. So Dion took several flights and travelled thousands of miles back to China. Not knowing the language, not knowing anyone, and setting up a search and volunteer team was certainly pretty overwhelming, but that's what yeah. I sort of set out to do and to make sure that I at least tried my best to try and find her, which I thought was probably really a needle in a haystack. What kind of help did you start to get, or how did the search go? So I started off with one lady, and she would help me putting up these posters of uh, Gobi being missing. And it also had a reward amount of money on there for anyone that found Gobi. They would get 10,000 Chinese dollars as well. So it was sort of creating a little bit of uh, awareness around the streets. And it was then that social media started to pick up in China on the story and how I'd traveled all of this way for this uh, little dog. They thought it was really amazing. And then the press started to pick up on it. And Whilst all this was happening, more and more and more volunteers started to come out and to help. And suddenly we had hundreds and hundreds of volunteers searching wow. day and night for Gobi. Yeah, it was incredible. It, was, it really was amazing. All these people coming together, looking for Gobi, it was amazing. But with all the hype, things took an unexpected turn. There was a lot of pressure on, on myself to, to find Gobi and we had mm. to just keep searching and keep looking. And, and one of the things that happened was we had that, 10,000 Chinese dollars, it's equivalent to three months salary for someone in that area. So yeah. a bit of a negative as well, because we had mm. a lot of bad people coming out of the uh, out of the woodworks trying to tell me that they'd had Gobi, they wanted more money, they were going to kill Gobi if I didn't give oh them more God. money. They would, we would have phone calls from people saying, we've got your dog and I'd go around to their home and, you know, to be a Labrador. And I'd say, that that's, this isn't the dog, is it? And they're like, no. Then it got downright scary. 
the story gained so much news media, social media popularity that the Chinese government started to also message us to say, look, we're happy with everything that's going on, but if this turns sour or if things go wrong or if Dion starts to say negative things to the press, then we're going to shut down the search and I'd be wow. you know, kicked out of the country straight away. So this turned into a way more complicated and stressful search than you first anticipated. At any point, did you sort of give up hope and think, this is too complicated and difficult, I need to just give this search up? The search was spiralling out of control. I was becoming very depressed about the state of where we were going with the search and the likelihood that we wouldn't find Gobi. It was certainly a very, very difficult period and something that I wouldn't ever want to have to go through again. Dion was really about to throw in the towel, give it all up, but then he got a message. It was actually late one evening and we received a message to say, someone's just sent a photo of this dog and they think it's Gobi. And there was a father and son who were walking through a park and they noticed this little dog between the bushes and looking sort of thirsty and hungry. And they thought, ah, I think that's the dog that's in there that's been missing that everyone's talking about. And we'll send a picture over and we'll see if it's the dog. When we received the picture, I wasn't so sure it was Gobi. Uh, the picture wasn't great. And she, the dog that was in the picture had this wound on its head. Hesitantly, Dion and some volunteers made a one-hour drive to see the dog. By the time we got there, I was pretty tired and pretty much over it all. And I remember walking up into the home thinking, this isn't going to be it. This is going to be another shakedown for money, another problem. As I walked into the house, I walked in behind the translator, the driver. So I was the last person to walk in and I hadn't said a word. And across the other side of the lounge room was this little dog. And it came running towards me and it was barking and yelping and whining, just like the dog along the river that day. And it jumped mm -hmm. up into my arms and I realized straight away it was Gobi. And how did you feel? Oh, I was in tears. I was like uh, amazed, uh, overwhelmed, overjoyed. I, I could not believe it. Everyone else around me just kept saying, is that Gobi? Is that Gobi? I was like, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I mean, I just couldn't believe it. Gobi was injured, but alive. Dion decided to stay in China this time to organize the paperwork for Gobi to travel. And then finally, they boarded the flight from China to Europe. Gobi actually flew next to me in a, in a little <laughs> bag and you know, a little carry-on bag. So she sat next to me in the plane. You know, as we drove down the street in, in Edinburgh where we, where we live, like, people in the street sort of clapping and cheering and then of course we had a little party at our place as well so it was the first time I probably thought about it for six months that I'd been away we'd actually made this happen and it had finally come to fruition that we'd brought Gobi home. Gobi settled into Scottish life. The weather is quite different from the desert though. She got used to the cat and becoming a dog celebrity. She has an Instagram at Finding Gobi and Dion wrote a book called Finding Gobi, A Little Dog with a Very Big Heart. And it's even looking like it's going to be turned into a movie. Not bad for a stray desert dog. If you'd have told me as a 13-year-old boy when I left home with nothing that I'd have this amazing story and Gobi as a stray desert dog would also leave the Gobi Desert and have this amazing story as well, it's, um, it's pretty incredible to think where life can take you. Life is full of surprises. I would never have ever have guessed that I would have, you know, foregone winning a race for a little dog that I didn't know. But, you know, at the end of the day, the race was irrelevant. And I guess I won Gobi in the end. And that was <laughs> that was pretty cool as well. Good consolation prize. Absolutely the best. And I wouldn't I wouldn't change it for any award or any medal. That's for sure. Dion Leonard. For Dog Edition, I'm Saskia Edwards in Mexico City, Mexico. The Desert Dog I Couldn't Desert is a winner of our monthly 101 Dog Stories contest, where we are awarding over $15,000 in prize money as we curate great dog stories from around the world. It was submitted to us by Saskia Edwards, reporting from Mexico City. 
If you have a story you'd like to share with us, visit dogpodcastnetwork.com for information on how to submit a piece to our 101 Dog Stories contest. Thanks for bringing Dog Edition along with you on your walk today. We'll be back next week with another episode, but chances are you and your dog will be taking a walk between now and then, and we have something else for you to listen to. If you're interested in hearing more from some of our guests, please check out DPN's sister show, The Long Leash. This week, hear my extended conversation with CBS News correspondent Martha Teichner. And subscribe and follow Dog Edition so you can take us along on your dog walk next week. What happens when one person in a relationship is a dog person and the other is not? Must love dogs. That's next week when we chase a tale about a new dating app for dog lovers only and dig into our relationships. If 80% of dog owners sleep with a dog in their bed and you want to invite someone to that bed, uh, you're going to have to have that conversation really early on. You'll hear that story and lots more on the next episode of Dog Edition. Dog Podcast Network is for dog lovers by dog lovers, and that means we want to hear from you. Visit our main website at dogpodcastnetwork.com. You can check the show notes for links and information on how to reach us, including our old school recorded listener line where you can call in to share your dog stories with us. Call 866-TALK-DOG. 866-TALK-DOG. We are looking for correspondence as we grow this podcast and this network, and you can be just like Saskia Edwards, and you could win in our 101 Dog Stories contest. We are looking for journalists and storytellers and audio engineers to submit stories. For details, visit our main website, dogpodcastnetwork.com, and check out our 101 Dog Stories contest. And join our pack. Be sure to subscribe and follow Dog Edition in your favorite podcast app and tell a friend about the show. I'm Pamela Lawrence, and I'll see you at the dog park. I'm James Jacobson, and I want to thank you for listening today. On behalf of all of us here at Dog Podcast Network, we wish you and your dog a warm aloha.